Welcome to our Souter Science Seminar series. Again, it's been a little bit since we've met. And uh, as we open up tonight, I want to introduce and talk about our next seminar, which is scheduled for Friday, February the 23rd. And we're featuring one of our own. Dr. Gregory Koop is going to talk about have we met memory, mirror effects, and mathematical models, something to appeal to everyone. So I invite you to put that on your calendar, 4 o'clock in this room. And no, I'm sorry, it's not in this room. It's going to be in 104, which is next door over there uh, for that particular seminar. However, tonight we have with us Dr. Kurt Thompson, and I've been looking forward to this presentation for quite a while. Uh, the seminar tonight is co-sponsored by the Shenandoah Anabaptist Science Society, as well as by the Souter Science Seminar Series. Dr. Thompson is a psychiatrist in private practice at Falls Church, Virginia. He was on our campus uh, a couple years ago during our attachment conference and participated in that, led a breakout session, I believe. Uh, he has clinically focused a lot on adults, adolescents, and families. So it's kind of those connections that he's been interested in talking about. We always try to have someone who deliberately talks about faith in their vocation or in their career. And so the mantle fell on him this time. And uh, so we've asked him to do that. He's going to talk to us tonight about loving God with all your mind, interpersonal neurobiology and Christian spiritual formation. We're going to do it a little bit different this evening than we do sometimes. Following his presentation, we're going to have two respondents. And uh, these respondents will give short five minute uh, responses to specific things that uh, Dr. Thompson says. Uh, first, we're going to have Christian Early, professor in Bible and religion. And then we will have uh, Daryl Byler from the CJP program. And then following their responses, uh, we will give uh, Dr. Thompson a chance to respond to the respondents. And uh, that should be about 5 o'clock or so when we get to that point. We will have an opportunity for audience Q&A, but I will give you an opportunity around 5. If you don't want to stay for the audience Q&A, you're welcome to leave, and then we'll take a few more minutes after that for audience questions and responses. Thank you for being here, and Dr. Thompson, it's a privilege to have you here. Let's welcome, welcome him. So uh, thanks for coming. You uh, don't have to be here, right? They don't, they don't make you do this to like to get your degree, right? No? OK. Um, well, it is, uh, it's a privilege to be with you uh, for a number of reasons. One is to be able to talk about our topic. Um, and uh, another, just to be in the presence of people who, uh, if you're interested in this topic, it means that at some level, you're working hard in the life you're living. And um, I don't, does anybody here, I don't know if there's anybody here who feels like the life that they're living is easy to live. If you're in a university, it often isn't easy to live. There's work to do. But beyond that, one of the questions that continues to be with me at all times, is what does it mean for us to be living well living energetically as we are followers of Jesus. And in this case today, what does that mean in terms of what his creation, creation of interpersonal neurobiology, how does that speak into what it means for us to live as followers of Jesus in the world in which we occupy? Um, does the handout, do they have a handout or not? They, there you all, are handouts in the back. Do you all have handouts? They're, they're brief, okay. They're, 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 pretty, they're pretty basic. Um, but I want to start with, uh, you'll, you'll see the first bullet. The first bullet is a comment that says that we're living in a world as exiles. And the reason that I'm starting with that is the following. This is going to be a conversation in which we talk about 
issues of science. But before we get to issues of science, I want us to uh, reflect for just a moment on the question of in what world do you think you're living? In what world do you believe you're living? And the reason that that's an important question for us to be grappling with before we even get to the science is that we live in a world where the primary plausibility structure or the lens through which we understand the nature of what things are and how things are real, the primary plausibility structure that tends to govern most of what we do is the plausibility structure of science. There's very little that we do. We don't, we don't like put a toilet in our house without doing research on this which is probably a good idea. But we don't really do much of anything without thinking about the thing that we're talking about through the lens of science. Now, that's not a bad thing. The challenge is that we who follow Jesus would suggest that we don't begin with science, we begin with a biblical narrative. We begin with a story in which science is embedded. And so we're not using interpersonal neurobiology to judge whether or not the gospel is true or to judge whether or not God is true or to prove that it's true. But we want to ask the question, in this world that we occupy as exiles, as exiles, because if we, if we read the biblical narrative, we would see that as Mark Laberton, who's the president of Fuller Theological Seminary, said in a talk he gave a couple weeks ago, and as Dallas Willard and Eugene Peterson have been known to say, when you think about the motif in which we live, what one motif usually comes to mind that helps us understand the world in which we live? And one of those motifs is the motif of we as exiles. And the reason I bring that up is this. In the world in which we occupy, we long for goodness and beauty, but for some reason, goodness and beauty doesn't seem to come around very easily. And for those of us who follow Jesus, it often feels like that world is especially difficult. And in our world of 2015, language for what it means for us to talk about life with God becomes increasingly difficult to find. We who long for a world of goodness and beauty long also for language for us to talk about what that world is really like. And I want to suggest to us that the language of the discoveries that are being made in the field of interpersonal neurobiology is a language that can help both understand and refresh and energize our life in God. So that this is a conversation tonight, not just about what do we know about the brain, but a conversation in which we're asking the question, how does what we know about the brain make the story in which we believe we are living more vitalized? About four years ago, um, I wrote a book called Anatomy of the Soul, and out of it comes five points. I just want to go over those real quickly and then get on to some of the fundamental issues of that we'll do in detail. And the first is this that I've not really met many people. We don't see people in our office where I work in Washington. By the way, um, it's, uh, in, in Washington as a psychiatrist, it's, really, it's, it's a good thing to be a psychiatrist in Washington because like, you'll never run out of a job. Right? It's always, people are always anxious before elections and they're usually anxious and or depressed after elections. And so we always have people who will be around for us. And in those, when those folks come into our office, there's never anyone who's not hungry and thirsty for a world of goodness and beauty, whether that's in a marriage that's falling apart, whether that's in a condition of depression or anxiety or manic depressive illness. What's striking about some of the new emerging data that we see in this world of interpersonal neurobiology is the way that data itself, when we pay attention to what we're learning about the way the mind and relationships, the way the brain and relationships interact with each other, when we pay attention to that data, that data points us to this world of goodness and beauty. In this way, the evidence of science is reflecting this world that we long for. But the other thing that it's doing, the third thing that we would say that's true, is that this evidence is also a renewing evidence. St. Paul says in his letter to the church at Rome, in the first chapter in the 20th verse, uh, paraphrased, if you look at nature, if we look at creation from the beginning of time, if we look at that, 
It points us to, it hints at God's power and God's nature. And what I want to suggest is that the field of interpersonal neurobiology does just that. It not only points to it, but it also gives us reason for it to be more energized, this life with God that we talk about. One important feature of this that I want to highlight is what we call the place of being known. Now, um, if you're in university, you're here ostensibly to acquire knowledge, I would guess. Like, we, we, we crave information. We want to know things. Is it, would that be fair to say? In fact, we live in a world where knowing things is hugely important because when we know things, we have power to then regulate and we would might even say control the environments in which we operate. It's one thing for us to know things, and in fact, we've come to the point where when we think about knowing things, the way we know things tends to be one way only, and that is the way of science, in which we set up research experiments, in which we are the observers, and we observe something that is outside of us, and we control for all the variables, and we ask all the questions, and therefore we come to a certain degree of knowledge about the subject that we're examining. Would that be fair to say, in shorthand? But it's another thing altogether for us to discover things when someone else asks us questions. It's another thing for us to have the experience, as we would say, of being known. It's one thing to know something. It's something altogether different when we have the experience of being known. In fact, in terms of what the brain's doing, the brain does something very different when it seeks to know something than when it has the experience of being known. Now, St. Paul says something else in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In the third verse, he says this interesting thing. He said, the person who loves God is known by God. The person who loves God is known by God. And that pre that's preceded by a sentence in which he says, there are those who think they know, who do not yet know as they ought to know. They think they know. Like, I like to know things. I like to know that I'm right and that I'm not wrong. And in fact, knowing things is not unimportant because I need to know that the medication that I'm giving to the three-month-old is going to help her and not kill her. It's important to know things. But it's an altogether different thing when he says the person who loves God is known by God. He does not say the person who loves God knows God. And that was a verse that captured my attention because it fits really quite seamlessly with what we're learning about the way the brain and relationships work together. The last thing that I like to say about uh, the book that I wrote is that when we're learning all these things about the brain and about relationships, um, people are interested in this largely because if I learn things about the brain, I learn things about relationships and the way they work, I think my life will be better because mostly what I'm interested in is my life being better. I like my relationships to be better, I want to feel better, I don't want to be depressed, I don't want to be anxious, and so forth. But I want to suggest that when we learn about the way the brain and relationships work, what we take in, and especially this experience of being known, doesn't just give us more information about ourselves, doesn't just change our relationships, it also changes the degree and the nature with which we think about our vocational callings. This is not just learning things in order for me to feel better. This is about discovering things about myself in order for me to have greater access to questions such as, what am I called to do in this world in which I occupy? Everybody in this room has a number of different vocational domains that you occupy. Your students, your sons, your daughters, your brothers, your sisters, you may even be parents. It's a range of different things that you do. And at some point, you're going to do something to earn money. But all of those things that we do are relative domains that we occupy. And all of them are going to be affected by the way we understand the way our mind and relationships are interacting with each other. And so the book Anatomy of the Soul was not one that was just intended for personal growth. It was also intended for us to examine the question of how does the way we learn about these things the way we learn about the way relationships in the brain work with each other, shift and change and expand our capacity for having greater insight into our vocational callings. Uh, as a psychiatrist, 
Uh, you know, I, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. If you're an orthopedic surgeon, you work with bones, typically, and on other things in the body. If you're a psychiatrist, you typically, people typically think that we work with things called the mind. That's the organ. But it's a reasonable question to ask. If we're going to work with the mind, what is it that we're actually working with? Now, uh, this is supposed to be a lecture, but usually when I'm giving a talk, I like to have some interaction with folks. And so I'm going to ask you a couple questions. When you think of the mind, just tell me some words that, you, that come to mind when you think of the mind. You can speak. Abstract. The mind is abstract. What else? Complicated. Brain activity. Brain, that's two words. Brain activity. <laughs> Processing. Cerebral. Memory. Consciousness. Knowledge. Okay, so all of these words, all of these words are, are helpful. None of them are not true. But I'm going to give you what we would call, from an interpersonal neurobiological perspective, a working definition of the mind. And speaking of interpersonal neurobiology, just to give you an idea about what I mean by that, we would say the following. Those people who work with the mind, and there are a range of different people who do, they might be psychiatrists, they might be psychologists, they might be family therapists, they might be research uh, neurobiologists who work with rat brains. I have to mention rat brains. If you give a talk on, the, on, on like, the mind, you can't like give the talk and not mention rat brains at some point. So there, I've done it. So you, there are a range of different people who are working on the question of the mind. They're philosophers, physicists, a range of different disciplines that study the mind. But many of them do not have the opportunity to have conversation with other people who are also studying the mind. And so there's not much crosstalk, if you will. And so my friend and colleague Dan Siegel, about 12 years ago, began to think about what would be a way for us to bring these different disciplines together that have things in common in order to talk about what the mind is when looking at it from multiple different perspectives. And hence, we get this phrase, interpersonal neurobiology, and we call it this for the following reason. When we talk about a working definition of the mind, it goes something like this. The mind is a process that is emerging, that is embodied in relational, emerges between, within and between brains whose task it is to regulate the flow of energy and information. Now, I, we, can you repeat that? Right. So the mind is an embodied and relational process that emerges within and between brains whose task it is to regulate the flow of energy and information. So here's a quick tutorial on that. The mind is, first of all, embodied. Notice that we're not saying that it is embrained. It's not limited to your brain. The brain is really crucial. Uh, how many of us, when you're anxious, feel things in your stomach? Right? How many of us, when we're nervous, feel things in our hands? Right? So we have things in our bodies that tell us things. If we cut our sensory input neurons off from our brain, there would be a great deal that we wouldn't be able to feel or sense. We wouldn't be able to have input from the outside world if we cut those things off. So our bodies are crucially important as parts of our mind. It's not just the brain. Now, the brain is hugely important. There are a lot of things that the brain does, but it's not alone in that. Thus, we say that the mind is embodied. It's also relational. By that, we mean the following. Nobody in this room, nobody in the room, would be in the room, ultimately, without the assistance of other people. Because somewhere, within about 30 seconds of the time you entered the universe, somebody wrapped you up in a blanket and put you in a warmer and like, then gave you food to eat and so forth and so on. We need other people in order for us to survive. But not only that, as far as the brain is concerned, as far as the mind is concerned, in order for it to develop, it needs interactions with other minds. In order for my neural networks in my brain to neuroplastically connect with other networks in my brain, I need to have interaction with other people. It is in those interactions with other people that certain things happen in my brain and in my body that otherwise wouldn't take place if I didn't have those relational connections. And so we see that the mind isn't just my brain, it isn't just my body, and it isn't just relationships alone. It is this interaction between 
this thing that is in my head, in my body, and these relationships that we have. But it's also something that is an emergent process. The mind isn't static. It continues to emerge over the course of our lifetime. It continues to grow. And when we talk about complex systems in physics, we talk about emerging properties. In other words, we have a system of neurons, we have a system of different functions of the mind and the brain and of the body, and together we would say that the whole is larger than the sum of its parts. You take one neuron, it's kind of sexy, but not that sexy. You put a hundred billion of them together, and they can do far more than we would imagine that they should be able to do, given what we know about one neuron. And in this way, properties of the mind tend to emerge within the context both of this embodied and relational process. And their role is to regulate the flow of energy and information. That energy is literally all the neurochemical activity that we have in the brain and in the body that's taking place all the time when you're awake and when you're asleep. And what we call information is the correlating meaning that we have that is, that is associated with all those neural firing patterns. So for instance, when you think of an apple, there's a certain neural network that fires in your brain that is correlated with what the apple might be. When you think of your best friend, there's a different neural network that fires. But what's interesting about all this is that it is in the context of relationships that we learn how to regulate these things. It's one thing for me to think about an apple or the White House it's another thing for me to process the fight that I had with my roommate last night. I don't know if anybody here had a fight with your roommate last night. If, 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 you're, if you're married to your roommate, then it, it might even be more likely that you did. But when these things happen, the question is, is there anything that I can know about the way my mind works that is now going to help regulate this interplay between myself and the other? that enables us to be people who, at the end of the day, are more reflective of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against which there is no law. How does knowing these things about the mind help us become more like Jesus, help us reflect more of what it means to be people of the kingdom that is here but not yet? Well, to do that, I want to talk about one principle of interpersonal neurobiology that we pay a lot of attention to when it comes to these questions of the mind and how relationships and our brains and our bodies are affected by these interactions. And that's the notion of integration. Now, in, my, uh, in the handout that I gave you, I'm in the first bullet, it says the word differentiation, and it's missing a word. And the word should be linkage, differentiation and linkage. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Imagine that you owned a company, and the company has several different divisions to it. And if you want that company to flourish, you're going to have to make sure that your sales division, your marketing division, your R&D division are all getting plenty of capital but they're all getting plenty of resources. But at the same time, you're going to want to know that all of those different divisions are effectively able to talk to one another. I can't just have the best sales force in the world if they're selling products that I'm not actually making in the company. It's not going to be very helpful for my company to flourish. And so for a company, for any system to flourish, the different subsets of that system must necessarily be well differentiated. So for instance, uh, the mind does a bunch of different things. We, uh, a, sh a shorthand for this is uh, our, our sifting exercise, S-I-F-T. We sense, image, feel, and think. That's a shorthand for that. Those sensing, imaging, feeling, and thinking neural networks and their corresponding different places and functions do different things. The question is, am I able to pay attention to what I feel? Now, this was a question that Steve asked me. Anybody here named Steve? Good, so I can talk about him. All right. So Steve comes to my office, and he's in his mid-50s. And um, 
The reason he was in my office uh, was because six months before this, his 17-year-old son had hanged himself. And he wasn't doing very well. Um, and when he came to see me, he was terribly depressed and he wanted to know how I could be helpful and he wanted to make sure that I knew that he wanted nothing to do with anything about God. Now, uh, that's significant because uh, we hadn't talked about it. We don't advertise ourselves as a, a, the practice that I'm a part of. There are seven clinicians in our practice. We don't advertise ourselves as a Christian psychiatric practice. Everybody who's there is a, is a believer, but we don't advertise it as such. But he'd been given my name because he thought that there was some stuff that I could be helpful with as far as his depression. And they, the person who referred him said, well, they're doing some interesting things there about the brain. This might be helpful. But he didn't want to have anything to do with God. I'm like, that's cool. We, can, we don't have to have this conversation about God. And as we started to talk and we started to explore why he was depressed, there were some things that became clear about Steve's story. You see, Steve was a scientist himself. He worked for a large government-sponsored agency that does a lot of science, I won't name it, that is located in the Northern Virginia area. But this is a guy who'd been doing this for about 30 years. And he was passionate about his work. And he was equally passionate, surprisingly enough to me, equally passionate about keeping God out of anything that, any, that, that science had anything to do with. But one of the things that was clear to Steve was that all of his knowledge of science didn't help him keep his son from hanging himself. And so we talked, and he began to reveal that when he was a young kid, he discovered that he was really interested in biology. And in fact, he wanted to be a biologist, and he was one of these kids who would be like in the creek and in the woods and all these places that you, know, you could be in order to be immersed in that world. But the challenge for Steve was that he was growing up in a family where people didn't really pay that much attention to what people were interested in in terms of the natural sciences. And he got a lot of discouragement from his parents. In fact, his parents had heard about stories about evolution. His parents had heard stories about what they do with students who are Christians who, when you go off to college and learn about these things. And by the time Steve was 17 himself, by the time he was 17 himself, he decided that he wasn't just leaving home to go to college and to study science, he was also leaving faith behind. And he had a reason for leaving faith behind because what he was also leaving behind was a relationship with parents that was actually pretty disinterested in the things that he was interested in. A lot of fights about this, a lot of discouragement about this. And you might wonder, what's this got to do with Steve is a 54-year-old who's depressed. And how does talking about the mind with him make any difference? So we started to talk about differentiation. See, Steve likes science, and he liked to talk about the science of the brain. And we would talk about, well, how well do you feel things? And, you know, as it turns out, Steve doesn't have much practice, much experience talking about emotion. And as we say, emotion is like the fuel in the tank of the human being. If we take emotion out of the human experience, human beings stop moving. And if you're depressed, but you're not really, you don't have much practice paying attention to emotion, there will be a lot about your life that you're simply not going to know. Again, you can know a lot about a lot of things, including biology and chemistry and so forth and so on. But Steve didn't have much practice with the experience of being known by others. And one of the things that we had to work on, again, we're not even talking about God. One of the things that we had to work on with Steve was the fact that he didn't have much practice talking about emotion. That was one of those undifferentiated elements of his life. But we come to find out that if you're going to talk about emotion, in order to do that, you have to talk about the way you talk about your life. You see, we feel things in the middle of the stories that we tell. We feel things in the middle of the stories that we tell. Important things that we feel are always embedded in the context of our most important narrative elements of our life. 
we feel things in the context of the stories that we tell. And it was something else that was also not very well differentiated for Steve. He didn't really pay that much attention to the way he told his story about himself, about his wife, about his son, so forth and so on. And as it turned out, Steve had very little practice, if any at all, talking with his son over the course of his son's short life about what his son felt, about what his son wanted. You see, Steve and his wife figured that as long as his son was doing well in school and had friends and there were no hiccups with the law, that things were going really well and his son was on course to go to the college of his choice and so forth and so on, how in the world did this happen and Steve not see it coming? So we talked about differentiation, not just of emotion, but of the way he tells his story and the fact that he's pretty disconnected even from his body and how his body tells him things that he feels, but he's not paying any attention to this. Not only, though, do we need to have things be differentiated, these things need to be linked, which means I need to be able in any given moment to be thinking about what I'm feeling, but also thinking about what I'm thinking and thinking about what I'm doing. There she sat on my counter. She was 15. My daughter, who's now 24, who's in her final year at Duke Divinity School. God bless her. But when she was 15, she's sitting on my counter, and it's Friday night, and it's 10 o'clock. And I, uh, our, our church, was planning a work detail for Saturday morning. Um, and the work detail was to begin at 8 o'clock. You heard that, right? 15 years old, family, work detail, Saturday morning. This is, this is bad karma. Right, to ask your 15-year-old child to be at a work detail on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. So I figure as a good parent, I'm going to do my job, and I'm going to start the week before and let them know, my daughter and my son, let them know that we're going to be getting up to go and so forth. So I like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm reminding them because I figure by Friday night, I don't really want to have to like, have a long conversation about why we're going early on Saturday morning. Are you with me? So I figure this is going to be like short and sweet. I'm going to ask her on Friday night, what time would you like me to get you up in the morning? And you would have thought that I'd smacked her in the face. Because the next thing I know, I see the eye roll and the, uh, and the body language and so forth. And you know, I thought, look, I thought I had done my job. Look, I, I read all the parenting books. I did all the things you're supposed to do right. And somehow this isn't working. All I want is to have a 30-second conversation and go to bed. But she's having none of it. If I'm not, you know, it's one of those rare moments when I think that I actually did something as a parent that I'm supposed to do. And I had, like, my, aware that, like, my body is becoming stiff as a board as I'm kind of reaching for the meat cleaver, right, behind me. If I'm not paying attention to this, you can imagine what would have ensued. Because, you see, I didn't want to have a 25-minute conversation about when you want me to get you up in the morning. I simply wanted to ask a question and go to bed. But as it turned out, we end up having that 25-minute conversation in which we find out that the last two days at school for her have been hell. And her resistance to tomorrow morning's work detail has very little to do with the 7.15 rise time. But I might not have much practice paying attention to the fact that things have to be integrated, things have to be linked together. And if I'm not paying attention to this, if I'm not practicing this, I'm living with a mind that is essentially disintegrated. Not only am I not differentiating things, I'm also not linking those things together. In the 86th Psalm, the psalmist writes in the 11th verse, Create in me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Create in me an undivided heart Create in me a heart that is differentiated and linked together. Create in me a heart that is integrated. Create in me a heart that is connected, not a heart that is disconnected within itself. And so Steve began the process of paying more attention to multiple domains of his mind in order for him to begin to have a better sense of how it was that he was so disconnected from his son who'd taken his life. If things are going to change, if people are depressed 
they want to not be depressed. If people are anxious, they want to not be anxious. If a marriage is in trouble, we want the marriage to not be in trouble. That means we're going to have to change. And in brain language, if things are going to be different tomorrow than they are today, the neural networks that represent what I feel and sense and image and think are going to be having to fire differently. And in our world, we talk about, in that regard, we talk about a thing called neuroplasticity. Now, 25 years ago, when I was a, when I was a medical student, if you had a stroke, the news wasn't good. Because if you had a stroke, you were in the hospital for probably about two or three weeks, and you might get physical therapy a couple times a day for maybe an hour. And then they sent you home to do the best you could. Because then we didn't believe that the brain could do what we, it appears that we believe that the brain can do now. Now if you have a stroke, you'll go to a rehab center where you will spend eight to ten hours a day, seven days a week, doing work that's activating the work of your brain, recruiting new neurons to do work that old neurons that are damaged can no longer do. Neuroplasticity is the, refers to the brain's capacity for neurons to change in three ways. One, neurons can actually grow anew. This is something we didn't think 25 years ago could happen, especially in the part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory in some respects. It's part of the brain that's responsible for memory. They can grow in number, they can grow in size, so neurons can get larger and bigger around. That helps them fire more efficiently. And they can also grow in the density of their connection with other neurons, which means that parts of me that used to never pay attention to any other part of me can now be connected to those parts. So the things that I feel, I can now begin to attend to with the part of me that's actually thinking about them so that I can pay attention to the fact that my body is stiff and not commit a felony in my kitchen when my daughter is upset. Which is a really important thing to be able to do. And one of the beautiful things about this that I would suggest this points to is this notion that St. Paul writes about in the 12th chapter of Romans when he said, therefore don't be conformed to the world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, that, those are interesting phrases Paul, I'm, I'm not assuming that Paul's thinking about neuroscience, Paul's not a neuroscientist, but I would have no doubt that Paul would not be surprised when we talk about the notion that our brain, our mind, our whole selves being transformed includes real embodied movement, real embodied change neuroplastically with these 100 billion neurons. There's some things that you can do to help support this. One, greater aerobic exercise. That's number one. Number two, what we'd call meaningful novelty, right? So learning new things. Now, not just facts, but learning new things that stretch you. So if you're going to learn how to play a new instrument, if you're going to learn a foreign language, learning things that require broader spectrums of integration of the brain, but that's always an expanding thing. There's never, you're never going to learn, there's, you're never going to come to the end of learning how to play the piano. Meaningful novelty. A third thing has to do with what we call the meaningful relationships, right? So interestingly enough, the degree to which I'm actually able to be known by someone else in meaningful relationships stimulates neuroplastic change in my brain. Another item is what we call mindfulness practices. Some of you may be very familiar with these, whether they're meditation practices, focusing concentration practices, and so forth. And then two more that are pretty simple. Better sleep and better diet. Better sleep, uh, do you, like college, like do you sleep in college anymore? Do you sleep much? All right, in high school, like my kids didn't sleep that much. In college you might sleep, but I don't know if, you, if, you're, if you're sleeping anymore. Better sleep and better diets. One of the things we know about Americans, it's not even that we all have to be on diets. Like the reality is like we eat too much food, right? One of the things that we can simply do is like eat less food. If you eat less food and eat food more slowly, you change the nature of the capacity of your brain to be more neuroplastically flexible. If we want our lives to be different, if we want our lives to be different, these are the things that we're going to have to do. And so these were some things that we asked Steve to begin to do. Now, what was interesting about this 
is that we also pointed him to other elements and functions of his mind. We're going to just list three here that we worked on quite a bit. The first was the question of attention. Now, these are, I'm going to list three things. There are a multitude of things that we could talk about. We could talk about this all you know, for days. But the first thing we talk about is attention. I asked you, how well are you paying attention to what you're paying attention to? That's a question for us. We like to say that attention is the engine that pulls the train of the mind. Nothing we do, do we do, that is not requiring a shift in my attention. But most of what we are doing most days, my attention is on autopilot. And before you know it, I've said something, done something, felt something without my intention of doing that. How well are we paying attention to what we pay attention to? Memory. The things we pay attention to are the things that we remember. And the things that we remember become our anticipated future. Like we say, we, we remember our future. When you all get up to leave here today, you're going to have to remember how to walk out of the room. That's implicit memory. But also with implicit memory is we learn how to operate relationally. So like my friend Brad, when he came home to have a fight with his wife at the end of the day, and he, like, they're in the middle of their fight, and he just leaves. He gets, leaves the house, goes out and gets in his car and takes off. Of course, this didn't help matters. Later we find out, well, you know, Brad was 10 when his father decided to get sober. And now his dad wasn't drinking, he was just angry all the time. And about the time that his dad would come home from work every day, Brad would find it convenient to get on his bike and take off. And you practice this day after day after day. By the time he was 16, he was getting in his car and taking off about the time that his dad would be ready to come home. And so it's not really a wonder that when his wife and he start to have a fight in the kitchen, at some point, his brain has had enough and he goes out and he gets in the car and he leaves. Now, if you'd ask Brad, why did you do that? He might say, I can't take it when she gets like this. Or he might say, I was afraid that I was going to say something that was going to make things even worse. He wouldn't necessarily say, I think I was having an implicit memory of what it was like when I was 10 years old and I had a fight with my dad and I had to get on my bike and take off. He wouldn't say that. But everyone in this room, relationally, is being driven by our implicit memories all the time. And the question is, to what degree am I paying attention to how that's actually affecting things? If I don't pay attention to what I'm paying attention to, my implicit memory will begin to run my life, and already is running my life, in ways that are creating problems for me. And it had created problems for Steve because so much of his implicit life had taught him not to pay attention to what he felt, and therefore not to read the nonverbal cues that his son was probably giving him, and therefore not connected to what eventually happened to his boy. We don't have a lot of time to talk about attachment, but suffice to say that all these things that we talk about that take place in the brain are deeply, deeply dependent upon the nature of those first formative relationships that we have with our primary caregivers. But it doesn't stop there. To the degree that we have relationships with others now, in which we are deeply known, it creates the possibility for us to have what we call secure attachments. And those secure attachments are highly correlated with highly integrated brains. Let me ask you this question. Could you give me the names of three people right now? Could you give me the names of three people who collectively if I were to ask them, they could tell me everything there is to know about you. And by everything, I don't mean just your vital statistics. They know where you're born, they know who your parents are. I don't mean that. They knew when the last time it was you looked at pornography. They knew the, they knew the last time that you lied about something. They know the last time that you felt really overwhelmed by the thing that you're most ashamed of. But they also could tell me what you're most happy about. They could tell me what you're most deeply, pleasurably anticipating. Who would those three people be? And in fact, do we even have them? The person who loves God is known by God, and we are known by God to the degree that we are known by others. And to the degree that we are known by others in real time and space creates opportunity for us to engage with integrated minds. Integrated minds, therefore, lead on 
to creative capacities that we otherwise, that we otherwise realize become self-limiting. I'm less creative when I'm more anxious. When I'm more connected to others, I am more willing to take risks because I am more convinced that even when I take risks, if I fail, I don't have to worry about that because I will not be left alone in the world when and if that failure happens. Those are things that Steve couldn't afford. Steve didn't know about what it meant to have relationships that would create a net for him and for his brain that would allow him to flexibly engage the things that he was most distressed about, including not just the loss of his son, but why it was that even as we talked over many months, why it was that he became increasingly angry with a God that he apparently didn't believe existed. The last bullet you'll see in the bottom. Just one item. Uh, I wrote a book uh, called Anatomy of the Soul, as I mentioned, four and a half years ago. And this August, I'm releasing a book on the topic of shame from an interpersonal neurobiological and a Christian spiritual formation perspective. I'm just mentioning this because one of the things that we see uh, from an affective standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, from a developmental standpoint, that shame becomes one of the, becomes one of the most prominent emotionally driven affective brain emergent properties that prevents the integration of our minds. One of the things that it turned out that Steve was so consumed with but had practiced not paying attention to was just how ashamed he was. Ashamed that he couldn't have stopped his son's suicide. Ashamed that he didn't have what it took now to overcome his depression that he had in the wake of that suicide. One of the things that we talked about was that it was necessary for Steve to become part of a healing community in order for him to recognize that if he's going to be able to process through this depression, we weren't just going to give him an antidepressant, which we did. We weren't just going to do psychotherapy, which we did. It was going to be necessary for him to be part of a community of other people who could walk with him on a regular, consistent basis that would open his heart and his mind to alternative ways of being. If we want our lives to be integrated, if we want our minds to be integrated, if we want, as interpersonal neurobiology suggests, if we want lives that flourish, it will be important for us to be connected in communities whereby which we can realize ourselves what it means for our minds to be renewed in all of their fullness, including our brains and relationships. You've been a lovely audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kurt. Um, I mean, it's going to be difficult for me to push back against that because I fundamentally agree. Um, and so I think what I would, uh, r rather than sort of ask questions of, uh, the, the sort of ask you to challenge or push out, I, I want to underscore some things instead. First of all, it strikes me that one of the most important things that we can do right now is to connect um, body and soul or body and spirit, which is to say that we need to connect what we know about the human being uh, at a very scientific level and also who we are um, uh, in the spiritual dimension. And um, what um, interpersonal neurobiology does is that it allows us in a very flexible and fluid way to make those connections and to go to all kinds of areas. Um, we can go to uh, conflict transformation. We can go to, to uh, um, community organization. We can go to discussions of oxytocin and um, testosterone. Uh, 
um, we can go to psychology, we can go just about anywhere. It's incredibly flexible and fluid in the way that it allows us to make connections that help us organize um, and look for specifics. So, so for example, um, the, the kind of dictum that an integrated mind is a healthy mind gives you something to work at, uh, namely work at integration, <laughs> work at differentiating and, uh, and linking, building, uh, building connection for the purpose of human, human flourishment, for the purpose of living towards the kingdom of God and what that might look like, giving us a concrete picture. Um, so not only does it give us, uh, you might say, a language and, and, and a way of con connecting science and spirituality, but it also, in a sense, gives us an ethic, gives us a politic, gives us uh, a concrete way of looking for what we need to, to be doing. And there are some very concrete, um, uh, you might say, techniques to be able to tell emotionally rich stories, like Steve was working on doing, helps us to connect ourselves to ourselves. Helps us, in other words, to come home. Helps us to heal. Helps us to move forward in places where we're stuck, where we're lost, because you can't go somewhere unless you know where you are. And so we have to come home to ourselves. Uh, and I think this is just as relevant for what we're going through at EMU and in the Christian church uh, as it is what we're going through in America or wherever you want to. This is equally applicable. It's beautifully flexible and fluid. Um, John Bowlby um, is famous for saying that life is best lived or best enjoyed or something like that. I can't quite remember the phrasing when it's punctuated by a series of going, going out and coming home. Uh, and, and we know, of course, that, and Mennonites certainly know this, that when you get scared, you circle the wagons and you restrict access from, uh, from outside. You, you're, you're too scared to explore. Uh, and, and, it, and it seems to me that we're at a critical moment in time where if we begin to work at some of this, we can begin to loosen up, we can begin to connect with ourselves, and we begin to embrace who we are and embrace the world. And that, for me, is what we're called to do and be. Thanks. Thank you, Kurt. It's always good to hear you speak, and it's hard to believe that Rachel is finishing divinity school. I want to uh, push in a little different direction. You talked about implied memories and how uh, they govern often our behavior. I want to talk a little bit about what that means when the implied memories are collective. Um, in our, our years in the Middle East, we had opportunity to, to travel into Iraq and to visit internally displaced persons camp camps and we heard the stories of Syrian refugees coming into Jordan and we went into Gaza uh, after after the war in 2009 and um, what was familiar in all of those settings was that there was a common narrative uh, a whole group of people who were operating out of, of, uh, of a narrative of being victims of something. And uh, so we, we saw that, uh, that narrative and how it, how it affected people's behaviors. Uh, we also saw some amazing uh, uh, resistant, resilience that was, was uh, 
was inspiring to see. But what I, what I would really like to hear you comment a little more on, and because I, I know you've done, uh, you've done some work in, in traumatized communities, how, what lessons might there be from, uh, from neurobiology that can really talk about how you bring wholeness and healing when, when the damage is collective and much broader than just to, to an individual? So. So thanks, Christian, and thanks, Daryl, for your uh, reflections. Um, uh, first of all, I, um, it's always, uh, it, it's, it's never a bad thing when, when you, you get, give a talk and somebody gets up and says, I, I don't really want to push back. I'm like, yes, this is great. So um, thank you for, thank you for that. Um, uh, but I, I, I want to, uh, to, uh, like, uh, to answer your question by um, like drawing from your, your comments. Um, and that is that, uh, especially you're reminding us of Bowlby's comments, um, that life is a series of going out and coming back. And um, we, we do, we, we like our, our individual, like as an individual, I will tend to circle the wagons when I'm threatened. And then the folks with whom I am uh, most closely aligned, we will circle the wagons when we are threatened. And of course, when that happens, you know, if, if I'm threatened, I'm going to tell myself a certain story about the nature of the way the world is, right? My dad hates me. This becomes the story. Now, it might not be until I'm 40 that I recognize that my dad was doing the best that he could trying to make up for his own state of not being adequate so he was worried that his son wasn't going to be so he's just driving me all the time but this is the story that i tell by myself and i'm circling the wagons to be protective now if there's more of us right we then tell each other that same story and as we like and again kind of obeying the laws of of emergence right the whole becomes larger than some of its parts so if there's more of us that are telling the story the story becomes that much more strongly embedded and if the story is going to be different, it's going to require somewhere along the way for someone to be willing to move out and away from where we are safe to a place that's dangerous, relatively speaking. So to your question, um, I, I was in, I was in uh, South Sudan um, a couple of years ago, spent some time there doing some work with about 30 pastors all of whom had been together on a three-year uh, study program in which uh, the work that we were doing on trauma recovery training for them as they were going to go back into their parishes throughout South Sudan, uh, we were the last two weeks of training that they were going to have. Now, interestingly enough, these pastors had come together to begin three years earlier. They had come from about 12 to 14 different tribes within South Sudan. And so there were men in the room whose grandfathers had killed the grandfathers of other men in the room. So you see where this goes. These aren't just Christians, right? These are Christians whose forefathers had been, like, violent toward each other. And as we learned pretty quickly that the, th this group, this cohort that came together was being asked in the name of Jesus to actually not circle the wagons, to come out and tell a different narrative. Now, you know, one of the things that you, we, you do, you, um, you, you, you practice this stuff in the U.S., you interpersonal neurobiology and attachment theory and so forth and so on, and then you start to wonder, well, gosh, does this just work with, like, you know, old white dudes? Is that the only, you know, those are the only people that this works with? What do, you, what, is this, what do you do when you go to South Sudan? Is this even going to be helpful? And we noticed that as, and we, we gave them uh, exercises to do, and we just started with the simple matter of you get two people to sit in chairs looking at each other. And we gave them a simple assignment of one person telling the other person about one event in their life in which they had been terribly frightened. And we'd given the, the listener the instructions to how to respond and so forth. These weren't folks who like had graduate degrees in psychology. And I will tell you that I could not believe what I witnessed 
when people were willing to tell their story truly, not tell the story about what has happened to my people, but talk about what has actually happened to me in real time and space, and have the others simply listen to that, pay attention to that, and to practice being empathic with that. Now, if you've ever worked with married couples, you come to find that these are two people who ostensibly love each other. And they're sitting in the room working on the parts that they're different about. And you want them to be empathic. Right? These are people who like have sex with each other on a regular basis and they can't be empathic with one another because of what's getting activated within. These are people who love each other and they have a hard time doing it. Imagine two men whose grandfathers had been hacking at each other with machetes 50 years earlier. All I can say is that what I watched, what I believe to be the act of the Spirit of God in a room in which these people were willing to tell their story, have their story be listened to by another, and have that story validated in terms of what they felt. But I will tell you, it had to be done one-on-one. -on -one in that case. Now, I would also say that it was striking to me that you had multiple people who were doing it at the same time. And the other thing that we notice about healing processes is that when individuals are willing together to do this kind of work, you actually enhance the capacity for the work to be done. Uh, has anybody here, ever, people seen the, the movie The Other Son? Are you familiar with The Other Son? Uh, I, would, um, I would highly recommend it to this story, to, all, to, to a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. Um, it is the story, uh, it, it opens with, um, two, uh, with two families, um, a Palestinian family and a Jewish family. Uh, the Jewish family, the father is a, is a colonel in uh, the Jewish military. And um, the movie opens with the families discovering that at birth, their sons were accidentally switched. And their sons are now like 16 years old. And so essentially you have a Palestinian boy that's been raised as a Jew and a Jewish boy that's been raised as a Palestinian. And what has to happen in order for these families to come back together? And what are they gonna do about their boys? And so uh, what I would say is that uh, the more able we are to take our stories out of what I would call, in my, in my words, out of like the theoretical. So when we tell, we have implicit narr narratives and we tell the stories about the way things are, what they did to us and so forth, that's a very different kind of story than for me to look you in the eye and say, this is what happened to me. To the degree that we are able to have those kinds of dialogues in which people are looking at each other in the eye, literally, we create space for transformation to happen. This, of course, is one of the challenges for technology, right? Increasingly, if you're 25, you're somewhere between 20 and 38 years of age, it's increasingly difficult for you, if you have conflict in your marriage, to resolve that in face-to-face -face conversations because so much of how you practice communicating with other people is done with your thumbs. And if your brain is not practicing resolving conflict, literally, by looking at other people when they're really angry with you, it becomes difficult for you to even imagine that you could tolerate such a look because these are things that we have to practice. And so to the degree that we continue to be extended away from one another and talk about the way things are apart from embodied activity one-to-one, -one, it becomes more difficult. But to the degree that we're actually able to do that, we create space for people to leave the wagon, to go out, right? and discover what we can do differently and come back. And as we come back, we also change the nature of the environment to which we return. I think we'll stop.